EAA's webinars are made possible through the generous support of Aircraft Spruce and Specialty, serving home builders and EAA members since 1965. Tonight, we're presenting What Does Airworthy Mean? Our presenter this evening is Mike Bush. He's president of the Savvy Aircraft Maintenance Management Incorporated. He's the author of numerous aviation publications, a certified flight instructor, and A&P mechanic with inspection authorization. He was presented Aviation Maintenance Technician of the Year in 2008, and of course, an EA member. If you come to Oshkosh this year, you will be able to uh, listen to a number of presentations that Mike will give and uh, speak to in person. So we're gonna get Mike on the screen here and get going with our presentation this evening. And good evening, everybody. As Mark mentioned, the, uh, the title of tonight's webinar is what does airworthy mean? Airworthy is a term that we use an awful lot in aviation. Sometimes we uh, are a little imprecise about how we use it. Um, uh, but uh, the meaning of the term airworthy is actually a little bit more complicated than you might think, depending on the context in which it's used. And as often the case with these webinars, uh, I'm going to um, uh, right, uh, do this talk uh, uh, using a an actual real life uh, story uh, as uh, as as an excuse to delve into this subject. And this particular <clears throat> story that that we're going to be talking about tonight uh, involved a um, a fellow by the name. Well, I'm going to call him Sam. Um, I won't tell you what his real name is to protect the innocent. But at any rate. Uh, Sam owned a 2004 Cirrus SR-22, uh, and he put it up for sale and uh, uh, wound up uh, getting connected with a fellow who we will call Bob. Sam the seller, Bob the buyer, get it? Uh, they came to, uh, to terms on, on this aircraft, and Bob wound up buying this Cirrus SR-22 from Sam. Uh, now, Bob in an abundance of caution and prudence, um, had a uh, hired a, an ANPIA to perform a pre-buy on this airplane before he closed the deal. And in fact, the IA uh, performed such a thorough pre-buy uh, that it had, that, that, that he actually signed it off as a hundred hour inspection. Now, um, most pre-buys aren't quite that thorough uh, this one apparently was. Um, when I heard about this story under circumstances that I will, will tell you about shortly, um, I sort of scratched my head when I heard about this because I was curious, since, since the inspection was so thorough that the IA signed it off as a 100-hour inspection, I wondered why he didn't sign it off as an annual inspection since an annual inspection and a 100-hour inspection have exactly the same scope and detail. The only difference is who's allowed to sign them off. Uh, an ANP who is not an IA is allowed to sign off a 100-hour inspection. But this fellow was an IA, and so he, per he could have signed it off as an annual, but he wound up for some reason uh, signing it off as a 100-hour inspection, uh, the significance of, of which will, will become clear. At any rate, uh, so um, Bob winds up buying this airplane from Sam, and a few months later, guess what happened? The annual came due on this airplane. Now, had had the fellow who did, did the pre-buy signed off his pre-buy as an annual inspection, this wouldn't have happened, but it did happen. So, uh, so Bob is now confronted with having to perform the first annual inspection on his watch as a new Cirrus owner. Um, Bob decided to use the same Cirrus authorized service center that the previous owner, Sam, had used for the previous year's annual, figuring that these guys know Cirruses, know this particular airplane, uh, gave it a clean bill of health last year, seemed like a pretty reasonable decision. 
So he puts the airplane in, into this Cirrus service center for an annual inspection a few months into his tenure as, uh, as owner. And um, about a week later, the shop informs Bob that it found cracks on all six cylinder heads of all six cylinders of the aircraft's Continental IO 550 engine, and that all six cylinders had to be replaced to the tune of about 10,000 um, bucks. Bob was a little surprised about this because the annual a year previous from the same shop had come up clean. The pre-buy a couple months before had not detected any cylinder head cracks. And all of a sudden the shop is saying that all six of his cylinders are cracked. At any rate, uh, Bob authorizes the shop to go ahead and pull these six cylinders. And um, once the six cylinders were pulled, the shop informed Bob that they inspected the crankshaft, I mean the camshaft, which they could do now with the cylinders off, and found that the camshaft was worn and pitted, and that the engine was going to need a tear down and have the camshaft replaced. Um, they estimated that in an additional $20,000. Now Bob is getting into a bit of a state of shock because all of a sudden this airplane that he just bought that had just gotten a clean bill of health and a pre-buy has a $30,000 maintenance bill. Well, things proceeded downhill from there because the shop did pull the engine, send it off to uh, to an engine shop. The engine shop tore down the engine and reported that when they did non-destructive testing of the crankshaft, they found a small crack in the crankshaft and that a new crankshaft was going to be required. And so the engine work was going to be very expensive. And in fact, by this time, Bob had completely lost faith in this engine, uh, having six cracked cylinders, a bad camshaft, and now a cracked crankshaft. And he, uh, he decided to instruct the engine shop to do a major overhaul. Um, and by the time the engine was done and back in the airplane, um, he wound up spending about $50,000 on this overhaul. Now, Bob was not a happy camper, as you can imagine. And um, Bob decided that he was going to bring a lawsuit against Sam, the fellow who sent him, sold, sold him this airplane, on the basis that Sam sold Bob an unairworthy aircraft and that, that, that Bob should not have had to bear the cost of all of this very, very expensive maintenance just a few months into his ownership tenure. So he brings a lawsuit against, uh, against the seller, Sam. Now, under normal circumstances, Bob would not have any legal recourse against Sam because traditionally, when uh, a used airplane changes hands, they typically sold on what's called an as-is, where-is basis. Uh, and normally the seller uh, provides no warranty of airworthiness, and it's up to the buyer uh, to assess the airworthiness of the aircraft before he before he buys it uh, by doing a pre-buy, which in fact is what uh, is what Bob did. Um, so it's it's normally a, a caveat emptor situation. It's the buyer who has to determine that the plane is airworthy by doing a pre-buy, and the seller isn't making any representations of airworthiness. Um, but in this case, Sam made a pretty serious mistake because the purchase sale agreement that Bob and, S and Sam uh, both signed had a paragraph or a sentence in it down in the fine print that said, and I quote, this aircraft is being sold in an airworthy condition with all of its system functional and operating. That is not a good thing to have in a purchase sale agreement because it's kind of an invitation uh, for the buyer of the airplane to come to, to sue the seller if he finds anything wrong with the airplane. And, you know, there's, there's always going to be something wrong with the airplane. But anyway, so normally this sort of language is not a purchase sale agreement, but in this case it was. 
uh, creating the basis for this lawsuit. So after two years of litigation and lots of legal fees, um, for some reason, uh, the two parties, Bob and Sam and their attorneys, uh, came to me and asked me to serve as an independent expert to help them resolve the dispute, a, a mediator, if you will. And they presented me, both both sides presented me with all of the the evidence that they had submitted to the court on this and asked me uh, to make an impartial judgment as to uh, whether the seller, Sam, should be liable for the costs that, or, that Bob uh, in, incurred uh, in doing all this very expensive maintenance. Now, the question of who should pay hinged pivotally on the meaning of Sam's contractual warranty. So the question I really had to wrestle with when I was looking at this was exactly what does it mean to say that an airplane is an airworthy condition? Now, to answer that question, of course, the one place to start would be the regulations. And the regulation uh, in, in the FARs that, that actually defines the term airworthiness from a regula regulatory standpoint says that airworthy means that the aircraft is uh, meets two conditions. It conforms to its type design and is in condition for safe operation. And, and note that, that there are two conditions that have to be met for an aircraft to be airworthy. Uh, the first one is an objective standard. The aircraft conforms to its type design. A type design is a set of specifications and drawings and, and, and so on. And that presumably um, everybody would agree whether the aircraft conforms or does not conform to its type design. Uh, the second part of airworthiness in condition for safe operation is a subjective standard. That is, different people could disagree on whether an aircraft is in condition for safe operation. I'm going to stop for a second. Mark, um, I'm getting a, a, a notification here that there may be network problems. Are you having a hard time hearing me or seeing the screen? Mike, I'm checking with that, and it seems like it's okay. I'm uh, watching on uh, several computers, and everything seems to be okay. We're getting a few reports from the field that uh, a couple of people might be having troubles, but uh, I don't think it's on your end or our end. Okay. Uh, the, the little notice has gone away, so um, I will continue, and let me know if there's some problem where I have to stop or back up or anything. Very good. So far, monitoring and everything looks great. I will continue, and hopefully, you can cut this little exchange out of the uh, out of the recording. Wilco. Okay. At any rate, so we've just looked at what the regulatory definition is of airworthiness, um, and and that's the theoretical. I call it a theoretical definition of airworthiness. But in the real world, it's impossible to know if any given aircraft meets that definition. In other words, is totally, I'll call it totally airworthy, um, without completely disassembling it and inspecting, measuring, and testing all of its component parts to make sure that they comply with the type design and are in condition for safe operation. And of course, that's that's not practical. We can't if 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 if, if every time we did an annual inspection or or, or had to uh, make a determination of airworthiness, and of course the regulation basically says that we have to make a determination of, of airworthiness every time we every time we start the engine. Um, was it FAR ninety one seven says that the pilot in command is uh, uh, is responsible for making sure that the aircraft is airworthy before he flies it. Um, now, and we can't disassemble an airplane every time we're about to fly it to make sure that it's totally airworthy. So in the real world, uh, we don't really use that definition because it, it's 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 not it's it's a theoretical concept, but it's not a practical concept. So in the real world, an aircraft is considered to be airworthy if it has been inspected in the last 12 calendar months 
by an appropriately rated person. In the case of a certificated aircraft, that would be an ANPIA or a certified repair station. And the inspector has found no discrepancy serious enough to render the aircraft unairworthy. Um, that would be an annual inspection for certificated aircraft or an annual condition inspection for, for an experimental aircraft. Um, but basically, that's the standard we use in the real world is, is the airplane in annual, if you will. Um, so let's, let's call an aircraft that meets that definition constructively airworthy, that this is not something you'll find in the regs. This is a term I just made up. But so we, we have the, the, the regulatory meaning, which I've called totally airworthy. And then this definition of an aircraft that that has had an annual inspection and passed it within the last 12 calendar months, which I'll call constructively airworthy. So now we have to figure out when Sam warranted that the aircraft was airworthy in his purchase sale agreement, what was he really warranting? Was he promising that the aircraft was totally airworthy at the time of sale or that it was constructively airworthy at the time of sale? Well, it seemed to me that the only reasonable interpretation of the contract was that Sam was warranting that the aircraft was constructively airworthy to the best of his knowledge at the time of sale, because whether it was totally airworthy was unknowable to Sam or to any other human being on the planet. Uh, you know, again, without without totally disassembling the aircraft, uh, there's no way to determine whether it's totally airworthy. In fact, there's an old mechanics joke. Um, the, the, there's no such thing as an airworthy aircraft, and, and by that, it's meant that if you dig deeply enough into an aircraft, you can always find some discrepancy. The, the question is, how how deep do you dig? And th there's some guidance about that. You know, the Part 43, uh, Appendix D, uh, defines the scope and de the required scope and detail of an annual inspection. Um, it, every manufacturer's service manual contains an annual inspection checklist, uh, but nobody, not the FAA, not the manufacturer, expects us to to, to in, disassemble the aircraft and verify that every rivet is, is airworthy. Um, th there has to be some practical bounds on that. Um, so at any rate, it seemed to me that the only reasonable interpretation of, of that purchase sale agreement was that that Sam was warranting to Bob that the aircraft was constructively airworthy. That is, it it had passed an annual inspection within the last 12, 12 calendar months and nothing had happened in in the interim to the best of Sam's knowledge to change to, to render the aircraft unairworthy. Then I thought about this a little bit further because some stuff seemed a little bit fishy to me. First of all, how likely could it be that all six cylinders on this engine developed head cracks in one year or, or actually in, in a few months? Remember, the, the shop that 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 condemned these six cylinders was the very same shop that gave the aircraft a clean bill of health a year prior. And within the, a few months before the an, this annual inspection, uh, a, another ANPIA had inspected the aircraft to the, uh, to, to the uh, level of scope and detail that he was willing to sign it off as a 100-hour inspection. And he didn't find any head cracks. So to me, something seemed a little bit fishy. So I dig, dug a little deeper into this and discovered something interesting. I discovered that this shop that had done the annual had just bought a fancy new eddy current test machine. And starting less than one month before this annual inspection started, had started using this eddy current tester on 
pretty much everything in sight, including all of the cylinder heads of, of, of every piston engine that, w that came in for annual inspection. Now, keep in mind that eddy current inspection is not an authorized or appropriate procedure for inspecting cylinder heads. There's, there's no guidance that says that eddy current should be used to inspect cylinder heads. And in fact, eddy current is, is a, a very, very sensitive um, test procedure that is almost guaranteed to come up with false positives if you use it to test a rough sand casting of, of the kind that, that, that these cylinder heads are. Um, in fact, um, when the shop reported these cracks to Continental Motors, uh, looking for a warranty consideration on the cylinders and said that they had found the cracks using eddy current. Continental said, well, we, we, we won't accept eddy current inspection. We require dye penetrant inspection, which is the appropriate way to, to inspect cylinder heads. And the subsequent dye penetrant inspection, uh, I, I, the, the lawyers sent me the dye pen photos. And they did not appear to me to have any non-superficial cracks that it would have made the heads unairworthy. So as far as I could tell, this whole diagnosis of six cracked cylinder heads was a bogus diagnosis caused by overzealous use of an inappropriate, non-destructive testing method by, by the shop. Um, okay, so the cylinders came off inappropriately, and then what did the what did the shop find? They looked in there, and they declared that the camshaft was worn and pitted. Okay, well, let's assume that they were right, that the camshaft was worn and pitted. Does that make the camshaft unairworthy? Well, Continental has guidance on that. They have a service information directive called SID 05-1A, which says that minor wear to the camshaft, the cam is normal, and that cam replacement is required only if cracks of moderate depth are present. Well, the shop didn't say anything about finding cracks. Um, and in fact, and they made no reference to using that SID as their inspection criteria. And so as best as I could reconstruct two years later, based on the evidence that I saw, of course, I. By that time, the camshaft had been thrown away, and there was no way of, of knowing what it looked like. But based on the, the, the written record, it seemed to me that the camshaft didn't need to be replaced following Continental's guidance on that subject. Of course, if the cylinders hadn't come off, which they shouldn't have, the camshaft wouldn't have even gotten looked at. But even with the cylinders off, it seemed to me that the shop again was a little bit overzealous in condemning this camshaft um, and not following or not presenting any kind of written evidence that they followed the Continental's guidance on the subject. Um, okay, so they condemn the engine because of a bad camshaft. It goes off to the engine shop. What about the crankshaft? Well, I looked at all of the documentation that, that the engine shop wrote up on this subject, including a bunch of email back and forth between the engine shop and Continental Motors. Um, and uh, in that correspondence, the engine shop stated to Continental that it could not determine via non-destructive testing, which it did, they could not determine whether the crack they found was a superficial feature of, of no significant depth or was something more serious that would um, have, have, have caused a problem with the crankshaft. Now, in an abundance of caution, given that the engine was all apart, um, the engine shop decided to replace the crankshaft rather than to take a chance. And I think that was probably a valid decision. But, but it also seems, seems to me, based on all of the evidence that I looked at, that that crankshaft would have probably run just fine and dandy to TBO and not given any problem. Um, because it was not clear to the engine shop, even after extensive non-destructive testing, that the feature that they found was, um, was anything more than, than superficial. 
And in fact, the place they found it is not an area on the crankshaft that has any history of, uh, of failure. So after all of this, and I spent quite a lot of time on this, as you can probably imagine, um, I wrote an expert report to the parties, concluding that in my opinion, the cylinders were fine. There was no need to remove them. The camshaft and crankshaft probably would have gone to TBO without any problems. And that none of this wouldn't have would have happened if the shop that did the annual inspection wasn't so overzealous and, and had such a, a an itchy trigger finger to to tear this airplane apart. Which brings us back to the kind of the the beginning of, of, of this whole dispute, which is who's to blame? It seemed to me there was a lot of blame to go around. Um the, the first blame is on the seller, Sam, who should not have signed a purchase sale agreement warranting airworthiness. That's not something that's normally done. And it's just an invitation for a lawsuit. Um, the pre-buy IA that Bob hired, if he was doing a pre-buy inspection with the full scope and detail of a 100-hour inspection, he should have signed it off as an annual not a hundred hour and had he done that then the airplane wouldn't have had to to go in for an annual at this shop and and triggering this whole chain of events it might have it, the, the, the chain of events might have been triggered a year later but at least it wouldn't have happened in the first couple months of uh of bob's tenure as a, as a service owner uh the service service center as we discussed uh, surely shouldn't have condemned the cylinders or the cam um, I don't really have any argument with the engine shop um, because the, the engine was a part and uh, I thought, I think they had to deal in an abundance of caution. They had to replace the, the crankshaft, even though they weren't sure that, that the, the crack that they found had any significance. And most importantly, Bob should not have authorized all of this expensive work without obtaining a second opinion. Um, you know, I always hate situations where I get called in two years after the fact and you know it's it's pretty easy to prevent an egg from being broken like this but it's really hard to, to unbreak the egg once it's been broken you know like being involved in these lawsuits is not particularly fun because uh, uh, you, it's not you know you can't solve the problem you can only try to deal with the mess that's left behind so should uh, should Sam be held liable for all or part of Bob's sixty thousand dollar misfortune? I'll leave that up to you guys uh, for the Q and A period. <laughs> um, before we start the Q and A period, just a a, a couple of uh, a couple of notes. Um, I will invite you to, if you haven't already done so, to sign up for my free monthly e newsletter at savvyaviation.com or by checking the checkbox on the post webinar survey that Mark's going to run when we get done here. Um, I, by the way, if you had been on the, my newsletter list or if you were on it, you got a, a very important uh, um, e flash uh, yesterday about uh, a new uh, potential, very, very expensive AD um, that may be coming out on. A very, very large, large number of continental, continental engines, um, and uh, um, if you if you weren't on my newsletter list, if you look at at, at my uh, Twitter or Facebook, um, you'll be able to get a link to that. But um, but I encourage you to get on my list because because we send out all sorts of interesting stuff, and and it's uh, it's it's worthwhile to be on. Um, I'll briefly mention that my book. Manifesto is available on Amazon if you're interested. Uh, it's a, it discusses my maintenance philosophy. It's only about 100 pages, and it's, uh, it's gotten, I don't know, 4.8 star review on Amazon. Um, I am presently working on a second book, um, which would be, will be on the subject of uh, a piston aircraft engines. This is a work in process that I hope to finish before the end of the year. Um, if you're interested in learning more about that book or supporting um, my efforts on that book, um, I would invite you to, 
to go to my Patreon site at patreon.com slant Savvy Aviator. And at that, with that, um, I will uh, open up to questions and my contact information it will sit on the screen so that if you need to email me or anything like that, uh, uh, you'll, you'll have that information. By the way, on my Savvy Aviation website, um, if you go to that website and click on the resources tab, you'll uh, have access to uh, um, seven years worth of my articles in uh, EAA Sport Aviation and AOPA Pilot Magazine and to uh, about 70 of these maintenance webinars that I've done sponsored by EAA and Aircraft Spruce. So there's lots of, lots of good stuff available on the Savvy Aviation website under the resources uh, tab. Um, so, Mark, why don't we open it up to up for some Q&A? Okay, very good, Mike. Uh, we've got a number of questions here, and I'll uh, start them up right now. So, uh, Thomas is asking, if a shop claims there is a major issue with an engine, prop, or other expensive item, what should we ask to make sure the shop used the right manuals and procedures? Is there a list of references to check? Okay, before I answer that question, Mark, um, I'm hearing an echo on your voice. Do you have a speaker or anything going? Because there's, there's a pretty good echo when you talk. How's that? A little better? Much better. Okay, great. Okay. Um, well, that's a very broad question. The answer is a little bit complicated, but most aircraft owners... Um, are probably not in a very good position to, um, to you know, to to fully research whether whether the recommendation of of a, of a mechanic is appropriate or not. Um, so the advice I normally give aircraft owners is that if your mechanic tells you something or advises you that some costly maintenance is necessary and you have any doubts whatsoever about it or you or you just have a funny feeling about it um the best course of action is always to tell the mechanic to give you a couple of days and then go seek a qualified second opinion there are all sorts of good places to get second opinions um type clubs are a very good place uh i i uh, for many, many years, I uh, did uh, uh, tech rep work for the Cessna Pilots Association and the Cirrus Owners and Pilots Association and the American Bonanza Society. Groups like that are usually excellent sources of, of qualified second opinions. Um, uh, I do a lot of the second opinion work myself, but, but my general advice is that, that any time a mechanic tells you something, that you are not a hundred percent confident in before you approve the work, uh, go get a second opinion. It's it's basically the same as what would happen if a, a doctor told you that you needed you know some kind of serious surgery. Um, uh, the prudent thing to do would be to go get a second opinion. And the you know any doctor worth his salt would encourage you to do that. And, and any mechanic worth his salt will, will not be offended if you do that. So just slow things down a little bit. Um, and I'm, I, I do an awful lot of that stuff. I, I know I just got a, an email today from a guy who uh, they found some, some metal in his oil filter and were telling him that he had to tear down the engine. And I suggested to him that they slow down. And I gave him some various tests to perform before. Uh, committing, committing to, to, to tearing, tearing down the engine because it was quite possible that the metal was coming from somewhere that didn't require a full tear down to resolve. And, and it's always better to take things slowly and carefully, in my view, rather than to jump into something real expensive right off the bat. This might be a follow up to that question, uh, Mike. Uh, a second, uh, second opinion, opinion this, is, this is from John. A second opinions are important, but how can I invite a second mechanic into a hostile shop with the shop uh, declaring cracks in the cylinders, the plane for sure cannot be ferried? How do I get 
another mechanic. So it sounds like there's kind of a delicate balance uh, with personalities and, and people in that respect. You know, it very seldom requires having the second opinion giver physically go into the hangar and look at the aircraft. Um, uh, you know, I've done second opinion work for, for 25 years, and it's all been remote. Um, and today, with, with, you know, everybody having a high resolution, resolution digital camera on their hip at all times and so on, with all the knowledge projecting technologies we have, there's really no reason in the world that, 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 you, that a second opinion giver would have to physically lay hands on the airplane. And there's actually no reason that, 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 that the shop even needs to know that you're seeking a second opinion. You, all you need to do is tell the shop to, uh, uh, to sit tight for a couple of days while you, while you think about it. And, and then go seek a second opinion. Um, so it's, it's, that's normally not a problem. Of course, the problem comes up if the second opinion giver disagrees <laughs> with with the recommendation of the shop, and and now you have to tell the shop that you you don't want to do what they told you to do. You want to do some you you, you want some other course of action. Um, that that gets to be the more tricky part. But you know, it's. It's, it's your airplane. Not it's not the shop's airplane. airplane. It's your money, not the shop's money. money. And, and, and you have an absolute right to dictate what work is done and what work is not done. done. And, and in the, you know, it, 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 if, if you get into a irreconcilable dispute with a shop during an annual inspection, which doesn't happen too often, but has been known to happen, um, you, you can always direct the shop to sign off the annual with a discrepancy, get, pay the bill, get the airplane out of the shop, and then get somebody else to, uh, um, to, to clear the discrepancy, even if you have to, even if you have to pay him to jump in a pickup truck and drive 50 miles out to where the airplane's sitting. Or, you know, often you can get a ferry permit. It depends on exactly what the discrepancy is. But, but the, these problems are not insoluble. But as far as seeking the second opinion, normally the shop doesn't even have to know you're doing that. Sounds great. Uh, Michael writes in, uh, first of all, Mike, thanks for all your work. And his question is, why would the mechanic sign off a pre-buy inspection as a 100-hour or as an annual? Shouldn't he just give his opinion? Yeah, yeah, that's very, very unusual, and um, th 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 that's, that's one of the things that sort of jumped out at me, that, 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 that it's, it's almost never the case that, that, that a pre-buy inspection is, is signed off as, as a 100-hour inspection. There are some cases where, owner, where, where buyers um, are advised, and this is always bad advice in my view, but are advised to... Um, to, to do, do an annual, annual inspection in lieu of the pre-buy. Pre I always advise against doing that for, for various reasons. Um, it's, it's pretty, pretty common, common in our pre-buy pre practice that, 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 that once the buyer takes, takes title to the aircraft, aircraft and, it's and it's still sitting in the pre-buy pre shop all opened up, up it's, it's common, common that we will have that pre-buy converted into an annual, but only after title transfers, not while the, not while the, the transaction is still open. It, it gets extremely tricky uh, to do an annual inspection where the buyer is paying for it, but the seller owns the aircraft because the buyer doesn't have the authority to, um, to, to, uh, to do maintenance on the airplane until he owns it. And, and it, it gets to be extremely messy. So we always recommend against doing annual inspection in lieu of pre-buy. And certainly signing off the pre-buy is 100 hours is an exceptionally weird thing to do. I've never seen that done before. And it is very unusual, as, as, the, as the questioner points out. Okay. Uh, Walt asks, if a repair center uses unapproved methods to determine faulty parts, are they responsible for the repair costs? Well, that's that's a question of, of civil liability. Um, that's certainly not anything that the regulations address. It's not anything that the FAA would have the slightest interest in 
getting, getting involved, involved in. in. Um, you know, you know typically, typically what happens, happens is, is the, the, the the owner says, hell no, I'm not going to pay for that. that. It's, it's you, you guys screwed up. up. It's on your nickel and the shop, shop gets, gets all mad and, and they, they have an argument and they even either come, come to some, some kind of a compromise or they wind up in a lawsuit or something like that. But it, it, there's no regulatory answer to that question. And it's not something the FAA is concerned about. It's not, so, not something that the regulations uh, address. It's purely a, a, a civil dispute, a business dispute. Okay. Thanks, Mike. Uh, another question coming up from James here. Uh, and, and this relates probably to a, a, a number of owners because uh, a lot of people are involved in joint ownership. Uh, any, any suggestions, suggestions on how to approach a pre-buy when becoming a co-owner on, on an airplane? Um, I guess we've done a couple of those where where where, where the airplane isn't being sold, but where um, a, a person is about to buy a share and interest of the airplane. Um, and it's it's, it's not, not as common, common but it, it's, it's basically not any different. different. The, the ground rules for it are not any different. Um, you know, I, I, one of the webinars that are that, that, that are that's in the can on the EAA video server is uh, is devoted to uh, to pre buys and and my philosophy about pre buys and and goes into a lot of detail on that. But the you know sort sort of the very short version is our philosophy about pre-buys is that the purpose of a pre-buy is not to assess the airworthiness of the aircraft. It is to assess whether the aircraft has any um, any discrepancies that would be serious enough or costly enough to either cause the buyer not to want to buy the aircraft, in other words, to change his purchase decision, or to affect what the selling price would be. So, um, you know, if we're doing a pre-buy, say, on a Cirrus, which is a couple hundred thousand dollar airplane on the used market, we're looking for $5,000 plus discrepancies. We're not really looking for $500 discrepancies, and we're definitely not looking for $5 discrepancies. So, you know, all, in an annual inspection, for example, you need to measure the brake discs and measure the cable tensions, all sorts of stuff that, that we would never do on a pre-buy because no matter what you find, it's not going to affect the outcome of the deal. Um, we're only looking for the stuff that would affect the deal, either um, either causing the, the, the buyer to walk away or causing a renegotiation of the selling price. So that's kind of our general philosophy of pre-buys. And like I say, there's a whole webinar on that subject that's that's uh, on the EA video server. Great. Great. Thanks, Thanks, Mike. Mike. Uh, next up uh, from Dwayne, uh, regarding ferry permits, a certified mechanic has to certify that the airplane can be safely ferried for a second opinion. So which mechanic provides the certification, the first mechanic or the second opinion mechanic? Well, well, obviously, you'd want the second opinion mechanic to do it um, uh, because the first, the first opinion, the first opinion mechanic, and you have had a falling out. So he's probably not the guy you're going to want to ask for favors. Although we we we've done that actually, it's it, it it's frequently the case that um, you can go to a shop that you're having an argument with in the in the course of an annual. And, and say, say look, look, you know, you know we're, we're never going to agree on this. You you, you, you don't, don't want to sign off the airplane is airworthy unless I do X. I don't want to do X. Uh, uh, we're just going to have to agree to disagree. Um, why don't I just pay your invoice? You sign off the annual with a discrepancy and help me get a ferry permit so I can take it somewhere else. And in in most of those cases, the the the, the mechanic at the shop is willing to help you get a ferry permit if if, if indeed he feels that that the aircraft is safe to make a ferry flight for the simple reason that he's as anxious to get you out of his shop as you are to get out of his shop that you know as long as the airplane as long as this dispute is going on your airplane is occupying space in his hangar and preventing some other airplane from coming in 
Um, you're, probably you're probably not, not willing, willing to pay his bill, bill unless he agrees to help you get out of there. And, and so, so in most cases, the, the shop is willing to help you uh, get a ferry permit, permit unless, unless the discrepancy is one that, 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 that the mechanic feels is clearly so severe that ferrying the airplane is, would not be safe. Um, I, I, I think that's about the best answer I could give to the question, but it's a good question. Okay. okay. Seems, Seems like, like a lot of diplomacy, diplomacy is involved in these sort of things. <laughs> Often. That's <laughs> true. That's, that's true. true. The, one, of one of the biggest problems, problems that we see in cases like this is uh, our, our aircraft owners that, that, that lose their cool and, and, and get combative with, with the mechanic. And that's almost always a bad strategy because typically the mechanic can inflict hurt on you more than you can inflict hurt on him. So even if you're hopping mad, it's always uh, a very good idea to try to keep your cool, be professional, diplomatic, straightforward, listen to what the guy has to say, because he, he might, there might be some validity to it. Uh, make sure he listens to what you have to say. Try as hard as you possibly can to come to some common ground. And if you can, if you can't do that, then um, then, then extricate yourself from the situation. And if, if it comes up in the course of an annual inspection, the, 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 uh, the right way to extricate yourself uh, that the regulations provide is to uh, direct the, uh, the mechanic to sign off the annual with a discrepancy. Right. It sounds, it's like, I guess, like many uh, relationships, I mean, we're, you're both going into it with the best intentions. And generally speaking, people aren't, Doing, doing this for, for bad or harmful, harmful reasons. reasons. I mean, they're all, I mean, we're all in the same kind of community, community wanting to make sure, sure these airplanes are flying safely and things like that. Right. right. But, but also, as, as is true of relationships, it's, 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 it's a good idea to, um, to, to, to interview <laughs> your partner before you get into the relationship. For an example of that is, you know, if you, if, if you have a, uh, an, airplane an airplane and the engine, engine is 300 hours over TBO and it's running just fine and you don't have any particular reason to want to overhaul it. Be before you take it to a shop that you haven't been working with before for an annual inspection, you probably ought to sit down with the, with the IA and say, look, my airplane's 300, 300 hours over TBO. Do you have a problem with that? And if the mechanic says, oh yeah, I, don't, I, I, I can't sign off an annual on an engine that's over 300, 300 hours over TBO, Th then, then you, you don't start, start the annual, you go take it to, to a different shop. shop. And, and it, it, very commonly that owners don't do the kind of the basic due diligence, due diligence before they hire somebody, somebody to, uh, um, to, to, to do the, uh, to do the annual. Now, in the case of our, our, our Cirrus owner, uh, Bob, um, he made what seemed like a logical decision. He took the airplane to the same shop that had done the annual a year prior and that, that gave the airplane a clean bill of health, which seemed like a pretty low risk strategy. Turned out it wasn't a low risk strategy, but he didn't have any, any good way of knowing that. He didn't, he didn't know that they had just bought an eddy current machine and they were really, really anxious to use it. Use it, yeah, get their investment. <laughs> Uh, Gary, Gary relates and another question, more of a statement, is saying, shouldn't you know and have a relationship with your mechanic just as you do with your family doctor, kind of the same thing? Uh, it's, it's very similar. similar. Uh, and, 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 you know, if, if you've listened to very many of my webinars, webinars you'll, 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 you'll know that I, I frequently um, make comparisons between aircraft maintenance and medicine because the parallels are striking. I'm checking, I'm checking the next, next question, question here from Matthew. Matthew. If, if the, the annual is signed off with discrepancy and the plane is worked on by another mechanic, who has to sign off the discrepancies? An A and P or another IA? Any A and P. In fact, you, you could imagine a theoretical case where where even an A and P wasn't required. It, it's it's improbable, but I'll give you an example. Let's suppose that the um, uh, that the, the, the discrepancy, discrepancy that caused the annual not to be signed off, off is that the left main tire is flat spotted and the cord is showing. Um, and, and for some reason, the, 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 the owner says, I don't want you to change the tire and the 
mechanic says I can't sign off the annual is airworthy with a with a flat spotted tire with the cord showing. If he signed off that annual with with that discrepancy, uh, the aircraft owner could clear the discrepancy because because changing a tire is a preventive maintenance item that an aircraft owner is allowed to do on his own recognizance. So. The, 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 the owner could actually clear that particular discrepancy. That's not normally the case, but normally the discrepancy can be cleared by, by, by any a and And it never has to go back to the IA who, who, who did the original inspection. Okay. Uh, throughout, there's kind of a, and I'm getting it with a, a number of different questions, kind of a vagueness in terms of the term airworthiness, and perhaps this question kind of focuses on that uh, from David. Uh, is there are there any other FAA references other than FAR three uh, three point five or thirty five, which gives additional guidance on the definition of airworthiness? Well, it depends on what you mean by, by airworthiness. The the only definition in the regulations. Um, of the, of the word airworthy appears in uh, FAR 3.5. And in fact, FAR 3.5 is a fairly recent addition to the FARs that only that only got in there sometime in the last 10 years or so. And prior to that, there was nothing in the regulations that defined airworthy. It was used all the time, but it was never defined. And in fact, if you go to the place you would expect to see it defined, which is FAR 1.1, which is where all the definitions are, you, you, you won't find a definition of airworthy there. Um, in other words, actually prior to the advent of FAR 3.5, which is a relatively recent addition, um, when we needed a definition of airworthy, what we did was we looked on the back side of an airworthiness certificate, which has effectively the same language on it. Uh, it's, it's not in the regulations, but, but it's, it's, it's the only place prior to the advent of 3.5 that the FAA wrote down a definition of what airworthiness means. I mean, we always knew what it meant, but, but it's, um, it's, it would seem like something like airworthiness really ought to get defined. I was always surprised that there was no definition in FAR 1.1. Um, but, but again, um, if, if you're talking about the, the definition, definition of what, what I've called constructive airworthiness, as opposed to theoretical airworthiness, then the regulatory guidance, I guess, would be uh, Part 43, Appendix D, which is the place where the FAA says what has to be covered in an annual inspection. Okay. Okay. Uh, there's a, there's a couple of questions, questions that kind of relate to getting the uh, engine, engine manufacturer involved. And, and I, I think this one kind of sums it up by saying, saying uh, this is from James, uh, are, are, are second, second opinions ever given by the major aircraft manufacturers directly uh, rather than, as I'm hearing it, indirectly through their manuals and references? Um, the answer is, yes, they do that all the time. They never do it in writing. And the manufacturer is usually the very last person that you'd want to go to for a second opinion. Because any opinion that comes from the manufacturer, at least in my experience, is primarily an opinion based on liability concerns. The, the, the manufacturer is always going to say, tear down the engine. Because, because that's, that's, that's the answer, answer that's in their best, best interest, both, both from a liability concern and if you want to be really cynical about it, a profit motive, because if you tear down the engine, they're going to sell you a bunch of parts. Um, typically, the engine manufacturer is, is not who you want to go to uh, because they're going to give you a maximalist uh, answer, never a minimalist answer. But, but yes, yes it, it happens, happens all the time. All the time. Right. Uh, you know, plus, plus the mechanic, mechanic is there on the scene and uh, he's, he's interpreting. He's a, uh, a, a moderator in many respects, looking, looking at all the different things, things, I guess. Yeah. yeah. And, and then the worst part of what happens is that it's, it's fairly common that if a mechanic is inspecting an engine, finds something he has questions about, he'll call the manufacturer. Get one, get one of these draconian, draconian answers that you always get from the manufacturer, 
And then, and then once, once that happens, happens he's, he's casting concrete. concrete. He's, 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 you, you, can't, you can't talk sense into him anymore because the voice of God has spoken to him. You know? <laughs> and he's, so he's sort of immobilized at that point. So you don't want that to happen if you can avoid it. Yep. Yep. Uh, let's see. Uh, a few more questions on annual inspections uh, relating to the ferry. I think we might have answered this one, but let me uh, just pose it to you here real quickly, Mike. If the aircraft was still an annual while in the shop, why would a ferry permit be needed to fly to another shop? Oh, because um, because, um, because the, uh, the an airplane can't be an annual. Um, uh, the, the moment that that the new annual inspection started, the old annual inspection went away. Ah, uh, okay. It's it. it I mean, even even if you did an annual, you know, three days after the previous annual, the 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 fact that you started an annual inspection on the aircraft renders the previous one immediately moot. So the, the key, key point, point there is the beginning of the annual inspection of the, of the next annual inspection, rather than any kind of time frame or anything like that. Yeah, yeah, more generally, um, I mean, this is this is sort of a specific case of a more general rule. The general rule is that the act of committing maintenance on an aircraft renders renders the aircraft grounded, and the thing that renders it ungrounded is a signature by an authorized person who is authorized to approve the aircraft for return to service. And who, and who that authorized person is depends on what kind of maintenance it was. If it was a tire change, it could be the owner or an oil change. If it was uh, something a little more elaborate than that, um, then, it, then it, would, it would probably be an A&P mechanic. And if it was an annual inspection, it would have to be an IA or a repair station. But the act of committing any maintenance, even the most innocuous maintenance like an oil change, grounds the airplane immediately. And the, and the thing, thing that, that, that ungrounds it is, is a signature in, in a, on a maintenance record entry by a, a person who is authorized to approve it to return to service, if that makes sense. Okay. Uh, this one is more uh, aircraft specific and may or may not apply. So we'll, 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 I'll pose this to you, Mike, and then we'll kind of go from there. This is from Billy. I once had an ANPIA perform an annual on a 1946 air coupe. He signed it off as a condition inspection, and I argued that it should have been signed off as an annual inspection. What's right? Well, as far as I know, the air coupe is a certificated aircraft, which requires an annual inspection. An annual inspection um, is experimental, right? Well, un unless it was somehow certificated in the experimental category, which would be right. pretty unusual. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I suppose, if, it was, if, it was if it was like an exhibition air coupe or something. <laughs> but, aerobatic but, aircraft, under, yeah. yeah un, <laughs> under normal circumstances, it, it, it's a certificated aircraft. It requires an annual inspection. It's subject to the terms of Part 43, which, uh, which um, yeah, yeah. And, it looks like it was a certificated aircraft. So, yeah. so it, need, it needs an annual inspection. Yeah. Yep. Good point, though, because you do occasionally find aircraft that have been put into the experimental category for some reason. Right. And, and by the way, the difference between an annual inspection and annual condition inspection is goes back to that definition of airworthy we talked about originally. Um, an annual inspection is required to certify that the aircraft is airworthy, that is, it conforms to its type design and it's in condition for safe operation. A condition inspection only certifies that it's in condition for safe operation. That's why it's called a condition inspection. And the reason we do condition inspections on uh, EAB aircraft is because they have no type of design to conform to. Each one is a, is a basically a one a, a one off manufactured by some guy. You know? And so that's why EAB aircraft are subject to condition inspections only, because there's no type design requirement to conform to, only condition for safe operation. That's what a condition inspection is. OK. Uh, Stephen uh, writes, uh, maybe continuing a bit on this, should the engine and propeller inspections that accompany an annual inspection of the airframe be signed off as an annual inspection or as a condition inspection? 
Well, that's, well, that's, 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 that's a good question, question and, and actually neither. neither. <laughs> um, okay. The, 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 um, um, the, the only, only thing, thing that can have an annual inspection is an, is an aircraft. aircraft. You, can't you can't do an, an annual, annual inspection on a piece, piece of an aircraft. aircraft. You have to do an annual inspection on a whole aircraft. aircraft. And, and, and so there's, there's actually, actually uh, an FAA advisory circular that, that, that is aimed at mechanics talking about how to make logwood entries. And the, and the correct way to do it, way to do it or the FAA recommended way of doing it, let's say, is that an annual is signed off with an annual inspection entry in the aircraft logbook. And then if you want to make subordinate entries in the engine and propeller logbooks, which are, which are actually not required, required to be done, done but, they're but they're a good idea. idea. You, sign you sign those off as 100-hour inspections. Again, again, a 100-hour inspection has exactly the same scope and detail as an annual, but, but you can't do an annual inspection on anything but a whole aircraft. And there, and there shouldn't be more than one annual inspection entry signed off um, for, for a particular uh, inspection event. That's, that's the theoretically correct way to do it. Um, nobody's, nobody's ever been violated not for doing it, for not doing it that way. And it's very common to see annual inspection sign offs and propeller logbooks, but it's not technically the right thing to do. It would be incorrect to sign it off as a condition inspection because it's, it's, it's necessary to verify that it complies with its type design if it's a, if it's a certificated aircraft. So a condition, a condition inspection really doesn't, doesn't apply to, to a certificated aircraft. Great. Great. Uh, Jay, Jay writes, does, does the condition inspection also come under Appendix D or, or some, some other appendix? appendix? No. No. Um, the the, the um, EAB aircraft explicitly um, do, do not, or the, the part, part 43, Including, including all of its appendices, appendices explicitly, explicitly do not apply to, to uh, experimental, experimental armature, armature built aircraft. Okay. okay. Uh, uh, let's see. see. So this, so this relates, relates to uh, airworthiness, airworthiness directive, directives, directives from uh, uh, FG, FG here. Does, Does a 100 hour inspection require a check of all ADs? Thought, thought this was only required at an annual unless, unless the AD was, was recent. No, it's, no, it's the, the, again, the, 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 the 100 hour inspection and an annual, an annual inspection have precisely the same, the same scope and detail. detail. They, are they are exactly the same. The, same. the, the only difference is. is when, when they're, they're required, required to be done, be done and, and who is allowed to sign them off. Any, any a and &P can sign off a 100-hour inspection. inspection. Only an IA or a certified repair station can sign off a, uh, an annual inspection. But, but otherwise, they're identical. I'm just, I'm just browsing, browsing through, through the questions, questions here because it seems like there's some that are kind of the same, so I'm trying to condense them here for you, Mike. A couple, a couple of questions on, on uh, actually, actually what happened, happened to the scenario, scenario who, who won, who lost, who lost but I we'll think we'll save, save that to the very end. end. Is that right? I don't know. Um, um, after, after I submitted my report, the, the – um, um, Bob's, Bob's attorney, attorney wasn't very happy with it, as you can imagine. imagine. Uh, <laughs> asked me a bunch, a bunch of more, asked, asked me to clarify my answers in a number of respects. I sent him clarifications. Uh, I do not know, know uh, whether the lawsuit has been concluded, concluded and, and if so, what the what the result was. Okay. Okay. Uh, Jeff is asking. I mean, what's the I, I, I mean, I think I think Bob had a, had a had a, a very valid beef, but it wasn't against Sam. Yeah. <laughs> he filed the lawsuit, lawsuit against the wrong party, in my view. Uh, let's see. Uh, 
Plus, Plus I'm, I'm guessing that the party that he could have filed the lawsuit against probably had more assets than the one he did file the lawsuit against. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> and that's, and that's the trouble with that sort of thing. There were so many variables to everything. I mean, the, there's no black and white to many of these things. It's... Yeah. yeah, and I get I get involved in a lot of a lot of these litigation things, and I I I just I hate the amount of litigation that that's in aviation. I think it's just one of the scourges of our whole aviation business is all these lawsuits. Yeah, I would agree. Uh, trying to. Uh, Get through some of the questions here. There was one that I saw, and I just skipped over it, so bear with me here. It looks like the, uh, the question was, uh, to kind of paraphrase it, is there a level of inspection that you would consider uh, for a pre-buy as, as compared to a hundred hour or a annual inspection. I suspect it's as much as you want to invest to determine things, but uh, what's your advice on that, Mike? Yeah, Yeah. well, it's, it's uh, I, again, I, I, I did a webinar on this subject, um, talked about how we handle pre-buys and what the general scope of pre-buy inspections that we recommend are um it's i i can't really answer that question with with any thoroughness in a q a session but there's uh, there's both articles and webinars that i've done on the subject that are available uh, we can turn to yeah. the webinar on right if, again if you go to my aviation.com site and click on the resources tab uh, you you'll, you'll have access to a, a ton of articles and about 70 webinars that I've done uh, under the EAA sponsorship, and um, you'll you'll find in each of those areas you'll find uh, stuff on pre buys that I've where I've written it up in some detail. Okay, there's a lot of specific questions that we're probably not going to get into because they relate to specific aircraft and and such. I'm trying to I'm looking more for the. Uh, I mean, you know, I've got my email address up on, the, up on the screen, and I would encourage anybody who has a question like that that, that doesn't get covered here during the Q&A uh, session, feel free to drop me an email, and I'll do my best to, to answer your questions uh, on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Couple it, may, it may be a couple of days because I, I, I have to, I'm heading down to San Diego tomorrow to give an FAA safety seminar, so I might not get to it until the weekend, but uh, drop me an email, and if I don't respond until Saturday, don't, don't get mad at me. <laughs> Great. Yeah, it looks like there's a number of questions that are more specific that kind of go beyond the scope of what we're talking about tonight, Mike. But, but let's see here. Some more, Some more questions, questions on pre-buy inspection, but again, I think we have that covered in the, in the other webinars and the reference information that you have on your website. Uh, yeah, I guess I opened the door to a lot of pre-buy questions with this, yeah, so. uh, this Sarah story, huh? There's, there's a couple of, yeah, a couple of pre -buy, yeah, well, that's, that's it, true, and uh, interesting that uh, uh, we're, getting we're getting a lot of good questions about, about condition inspections, inspections too, as compared to annual yeah. and how they relate to type, type certified and experimental. Uh, that's, that's in my experience, that's always a, uh, an area that needs a, needs a bit of clarity. clarity. Yeah. Yeah. You know, Mark, you know, Mark I'm, 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 I'm sometimes, sometimes accused, accused, particularly by A and P's, of engaging in mechanic bashing, bashing and, and actually. I, I, I really need to clarify that, you know, you know most uh, my company is involved in, you know, thousands of maintenance events every year, and most of them go very smoothly, um, and most mechanics are really good and really dedicated. But the horror stories, like the one I related tonight and the ones I often talk about in, in my articles and webinars, are the ones that have the, that have the most uh, value in terms of, of, of learning lessons, you know. So if, if, I, if I tell a lot of horror stories, it's not because, because all maintenance is horrible, because it isn't. Uh, 
it, it, it's, it's just because, because that's 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 that's, that's, where, that's where you, where you have, have to look to to, to, to learn learn, learn these lessons, lessons. I think. Well, I think, well, I think you're, you're absolutely right. right. You're, you're, you're shining, shining the cold, cold harsh light, light on something, something that really reveals what, what the regulations, regulations are and and, and some, of some of the some of the, some of the processes and steps you need to get through. And without those outliers like this, you know. Probably, probably 90% percent of everything, everything goes smoothly, goes smoothly but, but without, without the outliers, then you don't uncover the things, things that you really need to know about. Uh, let's, let's see. A few more, few more specific, specific questions, questions that, that uh, is probably, probably better, better addressed to an email to you, email to you Mike. Mike. Uh, it looks, looks like, like I've, I'm, I'm fairly, fairly confident, confident that we've covered all the big topics. topics. I mean, beyond okay. Okay. getting the more specifics, I think we're pretty close to uh, uh, the questions, questions here. Let's, Let's see. see. Here's one. Well, once, well, once again, again, anybody who didn't get their question, question answered, answered um, feel, free feel free to drop me an email, email and I'll, I'll right. try to get back to you. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think, I think right, right now that we're getting, getting into more, you know, my airplane questions, which are probably better uh, and more appropriately addressed by uh, sending an email to Mike, or uh, and also regarding the uh, the pre-buy inspection stuff, which we have information uh, on the, on the EA webinar series, and also uh, Mike has references to that too, which go to that in a bit more depth, kind of beyond the scope of uh, the Q and A session here. Is there anything you'd like to uh, wrap things up with, Mike, or? Uh, uh, just, just, just one, just one thing. thing. I, I, I just, I just wanted, wanted to mention the the next, the next few webinars, webinars that I'm going to be doing. You know, I do these things on the first first, first Wednesday of every month, and, and I try to have the, have the next three, three of them always scheduled, scheduled in advance. So the, the one for next month um, is entitled, is entitled buy, or "Buy or Walk Away,", away and it, it it it's it's actually, actually talking about. about the, the this whole pre-buy pre issue in, in another way, which is, you know, you're, you're interested in buying an airplane, you have a pre-buy, the, the pre-buy reveals some problems. How do you make the decision whether the problem is severe enough to walk away from the deal or, or whether it's, it's something you can uh, live with or deal with in negotiation on price and so on. So that's really what the, the May webinar is about, um, making the, that buyer walk away decision when you're buying an airplane. Uh, the, uh, the June, June webinar, webinar is about field, field approvals, approvals, what kinds of, of alterations require field approvals and what, what kind don't. And if you if you want to make an alteration that does require field approval, what the right way to go about it is to, to maximize your chance of getting the thing approved. And then the, and then the July, uh, the July one is, uh, is on uh, bore scopes. Um, we, we have had some massive advances recently and, uh, new, bore new bore scopes coming out that are better and cheaper, cheaper than what we've had before, and, and uh, I want to talk about about, about bore, bore scopes and, and the fact, the fact that, that nowadays the, the there are good good ones that are that are cheap, cheap enough, enough that 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 every, that every aircraft owner who who does who his own oil changes could, can, can afford one, and so we'll be, so we'll be talking about that. that. Yeah, I mean, and that's all I have. Yeah, that, yeah, those topics, those topics are great, especially, especially the boroscopes, because, you know, just at the, at the experimental level, level, I mean, the technology has really put, put that, kind that kind of device in, in, in a reasonably affordable way to, to, most, to most folks and, and uh, with, some with some amazing, amazing capabilities, too. Indeed. Indeed. Great. Great. Let's, let's see. see uh, uh, Looks like, Looks that's, like about that's about it for all the kind of the, kind of the, 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 the general, general big big picture, picture questions, questions, Mike. Okay. Okay. Well, well I look forward to seeing everybody next, next month. month. Uh, uh, stick, stick around, around when Mark, Mark puts, puts, up puts up the survey so that EAA can get, can get some feedback, feedback on whether you, whether whether you like these webinars and, and what we can do to make them better. Great, great. Well, Mike, I want to say thank, thank you very much for, very much for uh, being a uh, presenter this evening. Uh, lots, uh, lots of good information. You have, you have a depth of knowledge that is, that is uh, uh, very, very few people come close to. Uh, uh, and we look forward to the upcoming presentations and also your presentations at Oshkosh. In, uh, I was looking at my countdown clock the other day, or actually 
earlier, earlier today, today, I think there's uh, uh, just, just barely, barely 100 days to Oshkosh. Oshkosh. So, mm -hmm. so. <laughs> things, are, things are getting <laughs> tense up, up in your neck of the woods. Huh? There's a lot of, a lot of activity, that's for sure. And I certainly appreciate everyone that has attended the webinar. Uh, this, uh, this evening, evening. I do want to remind, remind everyone that, that uh, we are recording the webinar and, and we will uh, post, post it to our webinar, webinar page, page so, that so that you can view it, view it again at your leisure and, and uh, get, Mike's get Mike's information in terms of uh, getting, getting a hold of him and, and uh, uh, some, uh, some of his, the, great the great reference materials that he has offered uh, uh, as, uh, well, as well in the books and so on. Mike, thank you very much. My pleasure, My pleasure, Mark, and thanks, everybody, for attending. See you next, See you next month. month.